housing affordability and power by design. This week on the show, Monique George of Picture the Homeless and Giampaolo Baiocchi of the New York University Urban Democracy Lab argue that a truly just housing policy requires a shift in power. Then from our TED Women series, two architects who are combating the effects of gentrification and serving low-income communities through innovative design. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Housing stress, it's a part of life for millions of people. If someone isn't experiencing it, they likely know someone who is. So states a new report by the Homes for All campaign of the Right to the City Alliance. Decades of leaving matters of housing to the market or to politicians or landlords just isn't securing housing for everyone who needs it. A new land ownership structure just might help. Models exist here and around the world. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has put some financing behind new community land trusts. The British Labor Party's housing plan includes a million new homes and affordability defined by prevailing incomes, not rents. In many places, this is an election year. So by what criteria should housing policies be judged? Our guests know this topic from the inside out. Giampaolo Baiocchi is director of the Urban Democracy Lab at NYU and the lead author of the Communities Over Commodities report I just quoted. Monique Mo George is the executive director of Picture the Homeless, which was very involved in this report. She also describes herself as a proud product of public housing herself. Welcome both of you to the program. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you. Thanks so when you, you when you say communities over commodities, what do you mean, Giampaolo? So um, in this report, we wanted to take stock of the discussion we've been having among social movements and advocates of housing and think from a sort of big picture way, what do we stand for and what kind of housing do we want? And it came down to a values question. You know, we believe that housing is a right, and we believe that communities are more important than commodities, which is to say, we want to think about the right to housing first before talking about public policy discussions about what works and what doesn't. Sort of, you know, the title says it. It's a values question. We believe housing is a right. And we think that thinking outside of the market structure is really important. Now, values have been mostly tied up with buy and sell values, the commodity value. Where has that brought us? How do you describe the situation that we're in, Mo? So I, I think it, it's gotten us to the point where the value has gotten such that it has actually pushed folks away from it. Um, and to, like, if you look across New York City and you see, you know, these amazing, beautiful buildings going up, but they're far beyond you know, tons and tons of folks reach. Yeah, we're talking multi-million. Exactly, all exactly. Yeah. Um, and then, so you, you, you then look and see, like, is housing really a human right? Right? I mean, and that, that's our thinking, you know, uh, from the movement side. But then when you see that vast amount of people are being displaced, when I see an increase in folks coming into our office, um, you know, looking for services, needing help with assistance, trying to find affordable housing or either being evicted or on the verge of getting evicted from communities that they were based in. And then you look at those communities and see these towering skyscrapers of beautiful multi, you know, million dollar homes or even four and five thousand dollar rental homes. You think that, OK, we're the only one saying housing is a human right. But does the city actually mm. embody that? Mm. What kind of numbers are we talking about? So I, I think when we, if we had to like, so for us, right, the city says 67,000 people sleep in shelters every night. We, as a, you know, on our side, know that that number is significantly more because you're actually talking about folks who are gone into a shelter. Right. You're not talking about street homeless. You're not talking about couch surfers. You're not talking about people who are doubled or tripled up in NYCHA. 
So, you know, I think our estimation, if you look at that, the whole, you know, um, breadth of the, the universe of that, is probably pretty close to over 100,000 yeah. people. Yeah. Now, we should say that this question of housing as a human right is not something you made up. It is in the Universal mm -hmm. Declaration exactly. of Human Rights, the right to shelter. <laughs> but it seems like we need more in terms of understanding what addresses this problem. And you've laid out some principles um, in the book, which is kind of in the report, which are kind of criteria. Yeah, so judging. one of the things we wanted to do in the report was to also think about what kind of housing we want. We think there's a poverty of imagination when we talk about policy solutions today. And one of the problems is we only talk about affordability. Mm -hmm. We have a huge affordability problem, right? So as a thought experiment, you should ask, who, do you know anyone who lives in affordable housing who's not in public housing, who's not in a rent control department, who's not very wealthy? Nobody I know does. Well, right? it depends how you define affordability, right? Right. So by the federal guidelines of 30% of your after rent income, it's, it's hard in New York. Mm -hmm. And nationally, it's very hard. Right, uh, half of renters in the U.S. do not have affordable housing. They're paying 40% or more. Yeah, mm -hmm. on one fourth, they're paying half or more of their income, which is absurd. I, we have to pause and say this is a absurd situation we're in. But then it's not just affordability, right? We want to put a, a, a number of things on the table. So housing for us needs to be really affordable, need to be realistic measures. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be permanent. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem also is that often low, lower rent housing is not stable, or the evictions are very high. Mm -hmm. uh, low income people get evicted very, very frequently, and we know that's not good for anyone. It needs to be inclusive. So we need to really think, who is this housing available for? Uh, people without documents, people with prison records, for example. We need housing that's clean and healthy and environmental in some way. So. In New York, for example, we have a huge problem with housing conditions on a separate research we've identified. You know, one in four apartments in New York has a code violation. Mm. Uh, and then this needs, we want housing that's democratically controlled by the community. I was gonna community. say, what about men? It, right, so we want the community that lives there to have a say or to have control over the conditions of the housing itself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means painting what color you want or do you want a playground or a community store. The shape of the neighborhood, communities yeah. need to be able to dictate mm -hmm. that in a, in yeah. a real bottom up. So way. you assess several different models from right. that point of view through those through the lens of those criteria, and, and what did you find? So, from our point of view, the U.S. model, which is the most privatized in the world that we've identified, so 97 percent of housing in the U.S. is private, and we have some of the weakest rent protection laws in the industrialized world. It fails on all of those. Not a surprise. If we look around. Uh, Europe, other industrialized countries, we find that countries with greater portions of public or social housing do better. But we actually wanted to talk about alternatives that meet our criteria effectively and well and that work and that we can stand behind. So we talk about limited equity cooperatives, which have some history in the US. We talk about community land trusts, which is a growing movement that I hope we will get a chance to talk about. Mm -hmm. We talk about this model from Europe, from Germany in particular, tenement syndicate. Uh, and we talk about mutual aid uh, housing cooperatives, which is a sort of Latin American version, uh, which we also think is very, very successful. So let's talk about one of those. I mean, the land trust is something you've been involved in, Mo, and so is mm -hmm. Picture of the Homeless. Um, <coughs> Mayor de Blasio is putting some financing behind mm -hmm. not just investigating land trusts, but educating groups about what yeah. they are. Yeah. What mm -hmm. do we need to know? When, where does this stand? And is this a new thing in New York? So it is not a new thing in New York. Uh, we have Cooper Square, which I think is f almost maybe 30 years old. So it's not a new concept for New York. It is a recent concept for a lot of folks. And it is a different concept because it is actually tenants collectively coming together to own the land, thus by uh, saying that the affordability on the land could be quote unquote forever, but technically 99 years. And then after 99, you renew for another 99. Um, but it is really about uh, affordability and being able to say that this building will stay affordable irregardless of the buildings that surround it. Mm. And uh, I know for us at Picture the Homeless, we see that as, a, as not only a model, but the model to retain affordability for folks who are at the lowest levels of affordability in this city, right? So folks who um, 
who are, whether, you know, they're on SSI or they're on some other kind of yeah. assistance or, you know, it's not just, you know, folks tend to take over, oh, they're homeless, they don't have any income. So, you know, we have tons and tons of working homeless folks who actually need housing. So talk to us a little bit more about how it actually works. I mean, the land yeah. is held in perpetuity or 99 years yeah. by a public trust. Yes. But people can still, as it were, own their own properties or rent their own properties. You can yes. have turnover. Yes. You're experimenting with a model in the in the, in the East Barrio. In yes. The Harlem district. Yes. So in the, in the East, um, the East Harlem El Barrio CLT, I sit on the board of, we have um, five buildings in the pipeline. Um, and three of the buildings have tenants in them now, and we're at the phase where uh, the our uh, nonprofit developers, Banana Kelly and Catch, are like actually going into the apartments to see, you know, you know what the issues are, whether they're fled or asbestos, because you know some of these buildings are are, yeah. are quite old, but they're beautiful apartments. Um, and really, what would need to bring them up to to code to see how can they be expanded some you know some may have to be turned into you know handicap accessible apartments and what's the um, level of interest are people excited oh my goodness wow so are folks excited so folks are beyond excited i don't think that there's a day pass that we don't get calls at the office around how could they get into the buildings and we actually have believe it or not 41 other buildings in the pipeline who are like how can our building get involved? We want to become a land trust. All right. So how does that pipeline become like a sluice gate? How, how do we? How do we? How does that happen? How does the city get control, or community organizations get control of more land? So I think it's island like Manhattan. So I think it starts with a conversation for the buildings that we have now. It started with a conversation with HPD, uh, Department of Housing and Preservation, um, and they have been really receptive uh, to the idea. You know, and thanks to the mayor for actually embracing it. Um, and then I, I think for them, they're like, wow, we didn't realize that this many folks um, would be interested and in that I think more and more that uh, folks who are interested talk to folks like at Cooper Square mm -hmm. or talk to our folks that are about to do it. They get excited like, wow, OK, this, this is an actual option that could keep us in our homes. Now, what happens to the state in all of this? I mean, the, a lot of the models that you're describing are ones where, given half a chance, communities can develop, become their own owners, their own managers. Fantastic. Take mm -hmm, some mm -hmm, housing mm -hmm. issues off the state's hands. But you grew up in public housing. We still need public housing, right? Indeed. Yeah. And, and what what's the nature of this mix? So I think I I think that there is a role for the 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 state to play in it. Um, and I think <clears throat> what that could look like uh, outside of funding, because there there's initial funding for our buildings, right? right. And then our nonprofit developers will have to partner. Uh, you know, with various banks and the whole nine. It would be actually awesome if they partnered with the state mm. and that the state actually put significant funding into developing community land trusts, not here, but actually across mm. New York State. Um, you know, we go to a conference every year, Grounded Solutions, yeah. and there are CLTs from all over the country yeah. and, you know, in various uh, parts of the country where, you know, states are, are yeah. pulling in and providing funding and the whole nine. So the nonprofit developer doesn't necessarily have to go to a traditional. So I've got two questions. One is how do you get the city on board? Was because that was exciting. Yeah. But the other one, you know, are there models globally that we can learn from? You mentioned some in the abstract, but it, can you tell us any more about some models where a municipality or a state is really doing the right thing in your view? Yeah. So um, maybe I can talk about the Uruguay example, which is a very inspiring one. But it's important mm -hmm. to know to underline something Mo said, which is the state needs to play a role. Right, so a land trust is a publicly held piece of land. So it's public land. Uh, all of the successful models that we know of from Burlington to Dudley Street in Boston, which is another incredible mm -hmm. model. Oh, yes. Um, city government and state government wound up playing a very important role. So I don't know any example uh, tangibly that wouldn't have yeah. state involvement, right? It's a question of values mm -hmm. and politics and political will. So the, the Uruguay story is interesting. So they have this model of cooperativism where uh, people, it's a, people put in sweat equity. So to buy into the cooperative, you can, you can instead of buying a share, you can actually help build 
the buildings, which keeps the costs down. Yeah. And if you think about the people who are moving in, they often have those kinds of skills yeah. anyway. Uh, and the city of Montevideo, for example, has a very high percentage of its housing is cooperative housing under the FUCBAM, uh, which is, I think they have 300,000 residents Amazing. Uh, all told. And these are democratically run, bottom up, completely decommodified, meaning you cannot buy and sell this property, right? This is public land that's now collectively owned. We collectively decide what to do with it, but what we can't do is sell our individual unit. There's no speculation. Now, there are some models where you can sell, but at a capped price, a capped rate, right? Isn't that so for people mm -hmm. that are worried, well, what if, do I have no private anything in this picture? Um, there are some models where I think you do, or you can have some degree of exchange, right? Yeah, and one of the things we hear about community land trusts in, in movements is that people feel that home ownership is a way to pass on some wealth mm -hmm. and stability to the next generation. This is very important for people. So in a community land trust, you can actually own a home. You don't own the land, exactly. but you own the home, so you could sell that portion. Mm -hmm. In a limited equity co-op, you can sell your share, but you wouldn't speculate on it. You bought it for $25,000, you might be able to sell for $50,000. Mm -hmm. You look at how much you put in, but you couldn't sell it for a million dollars. So this is an election year. People are excited. How can they get involved? And, and tell us a bit more about how you did get the mayor involved in all this, because it's a brand new day as far as yes. that goes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, shout out to Pitch of the Homeless, who has been doing this way before I got there. I've, I've been the executive director now 14 months. Um, uh, but our members have been talking about this wow, it's got to be a good six, seven years, and really, really working to not just um, get the word out to potential buildings, but actually pushing elected officials and the mayor, um, since he came on board, that this was a viable idea, and this was something that, you know, really had some, some grit to it to offer truly affordable housing, not just but really get at the, the folks who are at the lowest realms who really need that, right? And to really look at if the city is dedicated to, you know, going down on the, the actual homeless roll, this is the actual way to get in, to people into actual affordable housing. Um, so there's a, a mass excitement about them. You know, folks are, can, you know, look on our website at pictureofthehomeless.org and they can come and volunteer. But they you say can, it's not just for people who are no. homeless, or yeah, no, not at all, not at all. Housing not crisis. At all. There's a lot of exactly. people in that middle row, middle yep. kind of category that can neither buy nor rent at affordable rent. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This and we have tons right. of that. Like where you know, people tend to think that you know homeless folks aren't working, where actually the numbers don't show that. We have, uh, there are almost, uh, I think it's way past forty-five percent of homeless folks actually work every day. But you know, the affordability in the city has gotten so bad that it's hard to get into something that you could actually fit to. And we see community land trust as that option. Just to clarify this question of affordability before we close, I mentioned at the top that under the Labour Party proposal in the UK, they're shifting the definition. How is it defined today and how do you think it should be defined, John Paolo? So federally, we have this idea of 30% after uh, tax income. Um, when, we, when we do inclusionary zoning here in New York, we use a measure called the area of median income, which we think is highly unrealistic mm -hmm. because it looks at the whole area and it tends to create figures and numbers that are not actually affordable. Mm -hmm. So we think it should be neighborhood-based yeah. measure. Because uh, if your East Hall and El Barrio district includes Upper Park Avenue. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You kind exactly. of skewed that median. Exactly. exactly. So final thoughts of how people can get involved. You mentioned they can come volunteer for Pitch of the Homeless at the level of uh, engaging as much of the community as they can. Uh, is there a clear question to ask a candidate that's running? I don't know, maybe for governor. So I, I think what is one uh, question is what is their you know knowledge around community land trust and what their thoughts on it? and how they can support it if elected. All right, sounds like a good or question. Or re-elected. <laughs> <laughs> Paulo, anything you'd add to that? No, and what the commitment is to solving the housing crisis, besides slinging mud at NYCHA, besides vouchers, besides, how willing is someone to look at different models and ideas, ones that are a little bit outside yeah, the, the current purview at the moment? Yep. Jean Paolo, Monique, thank you so much for coming in and talking about this so much. Well, good news, perhaps, on the housing front. Yeah, definitely. we'll keep we'll keep our eyes out. Thanks, thank for you. Thanks for having You're us. Welcome. I think when we started, we were both sort of like 
not unicorns, but there weren't too many of us. We're still unicorns. Okay, yeah, well, as, as black female <laughs> <laughs> architects, like, we're still wow. unicorns, but at least, in, in, at least in terms of public interest design, we are no longer. Yes, that is true. Yes. Thank God. My name is Liz Ogbu, and I'm founder and principal of Studio O. My name is Deanna Van Buren, and I am the co-founder and design director of Designing Justice, Designing Spaces. Well, I think now we are seeing in a lot of cities a process of gentrification, um, which has sort of been synonymous with the displacement of poor residents by wealthier newcomers, as the city which was abandoned as people moved out to the suburbs is now being seen as sexy again, and people are moving back in. And we're once again seeing a pattern where the poor and people of color are being displaced. And so what I want is, it's not that these areas don't need new services, new resources, new housing, but we should figure out a way to allow people to have the capacity to stay in their homes and in those communities rather than saying we're going to repeat this cycle of displacing people again. So gentrification and incarceration, I mean, in terms of the relationship that we see in it, is just where you build these things in relationship to the communities and neighborhoods. And the fact that when people are incarcerated, they have to leave their community and they're in an exoskeleton. So their families are struggling, they're having to move around, but their partner, their, their husband is incarcerated somewhere. So when they come back, it's a bit of a disaster. There was never really many places for them to go because of the, you can't get Section 8 housing if you've been formally incarcerated. And then in Oakland, there is no Section 8 housing. So people end up homeless, right? So if you're incarcerated, you come back, people are already being displaced, you can't get Section 8 housing, so you just end up in the streets. So it's a disaster from that perspective, at least in Oakland where we're seeing it every day as our tent cities bloom. This specific project has less restorative justice and more restorative economics. So there are other concepts in there about bridging the digital divide and fabrication for low-income communities of color. Uh, we will have social enterprises on the ground floor. So this one really focuses on that piece. So how do you take the program of the building in the place and make it basically fund the project? So we're trying some weird new things. We're trying to be at the end of social impact investing, social impact bonds. How do you pay for things in a different way as opposed to your traditional developer who's just doing market rate, right? It's got, I gotta make all my money back and I gotta make a lot of money back. One of the interesting things I think is that a lot of times that from the for-profit developers, they, you know, there were definitely some evil ones out there. I don't think <laughs> yes. that can be disputed. Um, but there are actually some who have a desire to do good or would are open to a way that allows them to create something that is financially sustainable but also socially impactful. But what they need is like a strategic direction that is helping them do that. And it's not coming in and sort of saying, waving the flag of like, oh, the poor people, the poor people, you must do this. It's sort of having an understanding of their goals and trying to think, work with them creatively to try and figure out, okay, how do we make the numbers work? But how do we make sure that we are actually also sustaining the community? And how are we thinking intentionally about some of the things we're doing? Like I have a project in Charlottesville right now and we're working on housing. And it's a low income housing development that because of all the changes that have been done in federal um, subsidies for housing has to be developed as mixed income. That's actually the reality of a lot of low income housing development right now. There's no money coming from the government to do just low income. So you have to bring in the market rate. And what we started discussing is that if you start doing it just saying, okay, we're just bringing them here, and that we solve the problem by the fact that they're both located on the same property. There isn't any integration in that. And so it's like, how do we think intentionally about the steps that we're doing, whether it's like thinking about the amenities that we're creating, that there are amenities that both of them can come together, or doing things that start to build community and build bridges before you start bringing these groups out there to sort of say, let's not create something that's just repeating the sins of the past. Um, I've been working in the Bayview Hunters Point community of San Francisco, uh, which is a historic African-American neighborhood. Uh, it was industrial for much of its history. Uh, had the power plant, sewage treatment plant, old naval shipyard, and also a lot of the city's public housing. And uh, the community was actually the one who lobbied for the power plant to come down. It was sort of the first time that they'd all come together to fight for something. Um, and it was a group of mothers living in public housing next to the plant that actually led that fight. So it was a pretty amazing success story. And the power plant came down, but then 
left 30 acres in its wake and the utility company cleaned the soil um, but then capped it with asphalt so that the clean soil wouldn't blow away. So you had 30 acres of asphalt sitting there and a five to 10 year development cycle at least. Uh, so my team of designers, which is me, uh, my firm and a couple other firms were brought in to try and see if we could turn it into a community benefit in the short term. So we've been doing all sorts of programming and attempt to address some of the issues that Deanna has been talking about. That the idea is that oftentimes with these development projects, you're looking at long timelines. And so it's how can you provide something that benefits the community now? And we can always be resourceful in figuring out things. So we do job training workshops, but we also do circuses and try and create places of joy as well as places where people can get skills that will allow them to get some of the employment that could help improve their condition. You know, when we build things themselves, how can we start to build some of the history back in? We'll see, and you know, hopefully we can do that with either the retail component of something, or is there a way that we can have the community come in and do an art piece that's integral to the project so that we understand what was here and who's still here, right? Who's here now, um, and what has happened in the past to make a mark on the land that way. So we teamed up with StoryCorps and we built a recording booth on our site. And we invited community members to come in and record the stories. And every story that's recorded in there is like an official StoryCorps recording. So it gets archived in the Library of Congress. And if you're African American, it gets archived in the Museum of African American History. So for many people, it was a way to say your story will never be lost.